Welcome to September, September. the 10th uh, 2020 Special Exchange Planning Commission Committee meeting. My name is CJ Mann and I will be chairing today's meeting. Uh, just a note that we are operating in a virtual environment and will likely be doing so for the foreseeable future. I would like to ask for your patience as we use this platform for our public meetings. There may be slight delays as we transition between speakers, presentations, and participants. If any participants have any issues with the technology, please call or send a message to the moderator. Today's moderator will be Keegan, Mr. Keegan McDonald. We have one item on our agenda today. I will ask for commissioners to hold all questions until the conclusion of the presentations. This item was discussed at our August 18th meeting. Um, and today we, we will be continuing the discussion of the proposed text changes of TC 14 uh, 19 site plan and plot uh, revisions. Those text change represents a major overhaul of how different developers, of how different development types are categorized. As such, we will use our time today to get an overview of the proposed changes and continuation of what we reviewed last time at our last meeting. Uh, Mr. Mark Holland will present on behalf of staff, members of the public who have signed up and wish to participate uh, will be asked to do so after the staff presentation. Mr. Holland. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark Holland. I'm with the uh, Planning and Development Department. And let me share my screen here. Can everyone see the screen? Okay, this is a, a continuation of TC 14 19. Uh, we, uh, just to give you a, an overview, it is an amendment to the UDO to incorporate a three tiered system for categorizing site plans based on construction type and level of impact. It will uh, include two categories minor and major for modifications to approved site plans. It will also conform to the site plan standards to the new chapters 160D of the North Carolina General Statutes for Development Regulations. Now, uh, at our last meeting, there were uh, several uh, recommendations that were made by the text change committee. Uh, those included to provide language to the applicability standards uh, to clarify and include the addition of several types of improvements to the proposed site plan tiers and to provide um, recent examples of site plans and how they would be categorized and reviewed using the uh, proposed uh, three tier system. Uh, the applicability standards were modified such that the language was added to identify the need for a zoning or other permit for activities regulated by the UDO, but uh, not described as a site plan. Uh, a standard uh, for establishment of a new use on a vacant property as a three a tier three site plan with the uh, exemption for um, ADUs, uh, development activity types for civic uses and for new commercial parking lots or reuse of an existing parking lot as a principal use. To go through how these are, are placed within the tiers, uh, tier one modifications were made to the uh, square footage and parking qualifiers, um, clarification of development activity types for civic uses and public parks, uh, open space and greenways, and the construction of ADUs. In, for tier two site plans, modifications were made to the square footage qualifier for structures and uses. And again, there was the uh, clarification for development activity types for civic uses and public parks open space and greenways and a qualifier for parking. For uh, tier three plans, um, modifications were made to allow, um, allow exceptions for new uses on vacant property for ADUs, uh, development activity types for civic uses and new commercial parking lots or reuse of an existing parking lot as a principal use. There are also um, footnotes relative to the table standards that were also, uh, also added. Uh, that is a, a brief overview of what was um, discussed, a high level overview. There are specifics within the text that I, I would uh, assume that everyone has um, had time to review. And staff did provide several um, samples of the site plans and the, uh, a sheet describing how those would be 
uh, categorized and what what uh, what sort of um, what sort of um, impacts they would have uh, based on the new three tier system. Um, with that, staff is available to answer any specific questions about the language or about any of these site plans that were submitted for your review. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Um, before we bring it back to the table, uh, Mr. McDonald, I think you said that there were a couple of attendees or guests that wanted to speak out or had questions. Um, do we have any, Mr. McDonald? At this time, um, I think I see at least one. Um, I will, if you'd like him to speak, I'm happy to uh, call Mr. Meadows and unmute him. Yes, let's call him. Frick. That's fine. Let's call him to speak first and then we'll bring it back to the table. And I'm pretty sure we have questions on the committee. Okay. I will also say we do have one call in user and I will communicate with them to see if it was one of the other persons who signed up to speak. Uh, but first is uh, Jason Meadows. I will go ahead and unmute him now. Okay. Mr. We can't hear you. You have a little bit of uh, background noise. I need him temporarily. Um, I can see if uh, he has a better connection in just a moment. Okay. Is there a second one? Um, Jason? Yeah. Your, your, conne your connection is still poor. I'm going to try giving you a, um, a, a call. If you can send me in the chat a phone number, um, that may work better because uh, unfortunately the audio connection for you is, is poor. Um, okay. While we're waiting for the metals connection, uh, we'll bring it back to the table. Um, okay. Thanks. There's, there's only three of us today. So, um, Commissioners Miller and Commissioners O'Haver, do you guys have any questions about what we just saw? I'm here too, CJ. Sorry, I was having trouble with my camera. Oh, okay. Uh, Commissioner Thomas will join us as well. Commissioner Miller, I'm sorry. I, I'm not saying that. Sure. I was looking at the some of the changes that we made under section five, um, the description of what a tier one site plan, what would fall under a tier one site plan. And in B1A Remnant one, previously, um, I think one of the, the big inclusions here was that if there is a change of use of a building that does not increase parking, by 10 spaces or 10%, that that would make this building fall, that that type of improvement fall under a tier one site plan. Um, and based on the amended language, it seems that that has been removed. And I was, um, but wondering if maybe that was picked up somewhere else and some of the other changes um, within the description of a tier one site plan. It was picked up somewhere else at that uh, that specific regulation regarding parking. Um, this was something that was discussed at staff level because of repetitive information. Uh, it, it is included in one of the other sections. And in which section um, is that? This is David York. If I could jump in, what? Okay. What happened? The change of use section is in Romanet two, and it's not tied to parking. It's based on square footage. But we, at the staff level, when we went back looking at things, there's been a substantial change in the parking requirements since this was originally drafted and commented on, and that was the the change that DX district does not have any parking requirements. And so there was a concern about equity of substantial expansions in the DX district compared to other locations in the city where 
basically anything in the DX district other than a greenfield development would be a tier one under the previous wording and only greenfield developments would be a, t a tier three. There was a concern about the equity. And so what, what Romanet one under tier one site plans and what Romanet one under tier two site plans reflect is the basically taking the average of the following land uses, um, multifamily, retail, restaurant, office, and industrial. And what we did was we took those uses, sort of averaged out what was the average number of parking spaces per square footage, and came up with an average square footage. So if we did it, if we judged which tier you fell in based on the square footage of your structure, of your expansion, as opposed to increase in parking requirements, this is sort of the square footage equivalent of the parking evaluation, if that makes sense. I'm I believe so. That that is where um, I, I I do understand the switch from parking requirements to the square footage requirements. I know from a policy standpoint, one of the um, concerns that I think um, some folks were hoping to address and, and thought that this would address is when you have an existing building type and changes, there's a change of use internally, but the parking requirements don't change at all, or if anything, they might decrease for that building. And to try to avoid sending a project like that through a tier three site plan. Okay, if you look at Romanet two, we under, under, under tier one. Tier or one two? If you look at Romanet two under D1A, tier, which is the tier one site plan, we added a parking ratio to that change of use. Originally we had, if you had 10,000 square feet or less, if you were changing the use of 10,000 square feet or less in an existing building, that was a tier one. We've added, or the required parking does not increase as determined by 712C. So that's one of those where if, if it's no change in parking or no increase in parking, but you have, you know, a 50,000 square foot change in use, but it doesn't increase the parking, then I understand that's, that's where we try to tag that rather than a minimum number the part we gave a minimum square footage basically at 10,000. You can go higher if there's no increase in parking. Gotcha. So that if it does not increase parking, that would apply to any size building, not just buildings with a gross floor area of 10,000 square feet or less. Correct. Gotcha. Um, for clarity, it might help to separate that out to a separate, its own room. And when I was reading that, I thought that was only for 10,000 square feet or less. And it's, I see that it says or, but. Um, yeah, we can try to make that more clear if that's not clear enough. Well, David or staff, I have a question along kind of those lines. I guess it would be under new word I learned, Romanette. Didn't know what those were called, but Lenny, Lenny uh, schooled me on that. So, uh, <laughs> on Romanet 2, though, we still have the word required parking. And I thought that I don't have the current <clears throat> language in front of me, but in downtown where you're exempt for the first 10,000 square feet of parking, um, the current, the way the current code reads, it says, required parking not provided and it takes out 
any exemptions like that 10,000 square feet, you can't count that. It disregards that. So regardless of if you're doing a, 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 a new project downtown that's less than 10,000 square feet in, in a DX, and you have that parking exemption, um, the fact that you're required to provide spaces still kicks in regardless of whether or not you actually need to install them. And I thought we were going to, I thought one of the objectives was to eliminate that. Does this not still, with using the word required, does that not still kick that in? Sorry if that wasn't very articulate. No. You're correct. That would kick that in for changes of use greater than 10,000 square feet. If, if the new use required an increase in parking, looking solely at the parking table in 712C, not look, not look, not taking into consideration any of the, uh, other exceptions or exclusions or carve outs that are in uh, 713. Well, am I, am I incorrect by saying I thought that um, when we first started talking about changing the text, that there was a desire to not have those exemptions kick you in that you would be able to take that exemption if you don't have to provide if you have to provide zero parking and it's through that exemption of the first 10,000 square feet of retail I thought and maybe I'm wrong I thought our desire was to um, allow that to sort of be in the tier one did I misunderstand that well what this what this does Brian is it gives a free 10,000 square foot floor area change of use, regardless of what the parking requirement is and regardless of any parking exemptions. Um, and then you could, you could change, you could change up to 25,000 square feet if the table didn't require you to have additional parking as a tier two. So you're saying it kind of covers it through this the square footage. So we so we built in instead of including the exemptions for parking, we kind of just built in the ten thousand and twenty five thousand square foot threshold. Gotcha. Okay. And what about providing for that an additional um, ten parking spots or ten percent square foot? Ten percent of parking as opposed to just not increasing parking at all. What Romanette are you talking about, Commissioner Miller? Uh, previously, there, if there was a change of use that did not increase parking by 10 spaces or 10%. Gotcha, so, okay, number one, okay. Um, and now we've changed it to that where it does not increase park, a change of use that does not increase parking at all. Um, just curious why that change, what some of the thinking behind that change was. You take the parking change, percentage change, regardless of any special exemptions. And if that increase is more than 10%, that was kicking you into a site plan. So the addition of one addition, the one of the addition of one required parking space was kicking folks into a site plan. What what this does is allows a change of use, regardless of parking, of ten thousand square feet. Any use to any use, any ten thousand, regardless of the parking requirement, is a tier one. And then it applies. If you're over 10,000 square feet and up to 25,000 under tier two, the same rule applies. The change of use of, of any any use to any use, regardless of parking requirements, regardless of parking exemptions. It's only when um, when you exceed those numbers, then it still allows a change of use to be in that tier, tier one or tier two, respectively, depending on size. Um, if the parking requirement does not increase. 
So only if you're over those numbers do you look you look at the parking number. If that makes sense. It does. So it's just sort of a trade-off there between those two changes. Which makes sense. Right. I mean if if the committee would like us to revise that. Right now we sort of have a 10,000 square foot freebie for lack of a better term. And then it's just based on whether you increase parking or not. Um, if you want us to put a buffer on that, we could revise what's highlighted in yellow in Romanet to, to provide the 10% buffer. But we, we left it as any increase versus the 10,000 square feet. But that's a that's a policy decision that I'd also add that it's really it's really up to it's, it's essentially up to 25,000 square feet because there's not a whole lot of difference between a tier one and a tier two other than tree conservation and forestation, which is never going to apply downtown anyway. Um, so it's it's more closely uh, a 25,000 square foot free. But we can certainly make that change. I think that that makes sense. So, so I just wanted to to clarify for tier one, if there was a project that was 15,000 square feet, but did not increase parking, that would be a tier one. Yeah, change if it's a change of use of 15,000 square feet, but it doesn't increase parking. Correct. That's tier it. one. And if it's 15,000 square feet and with this change and does increase parking, but by fewer than 10 spaces or 10%, then it's tier two. If we'd make That's this currently change. worded, yes, yeah. Okay. I think that, that makes sense reading together. Um, I Maybe this was covered in the first two or three minutes um, when I couldn't see or hear anything, but um, was there and any sort of like basis for the 3,600 square feet number? The 3,600 square feet number is sort of the, if you take um, a warehouse use, a restaurant use, a general retail use, residential and office, if you average the parking requirements for that, 3,600 square feet is roughly 10 spaces of the average. It's not the highest, it's not the lowest ratio of square feet to parking, but we took we took the average. And so that's where we reached 3,600 for tier one, and that's where we reached 9,000 for tier two in Romanet one under uh, section five B2A Romanet one. That's where those numbers came from. It was still trying to use parking as sort of the basis because that's the intensity element. Um, but converted over to square footage, it, we felt like that's more user friendly for someone reading the code and it's definitely sort of easier to implement. Okay, thank you. Let's, Commissioner Haber, did you have any any questions or anything that? Uh, I'm I'm still just trying to to digest all this. I have some other questions, so I don't know if we're we're still on this topic of the tier one, tier two. Or yeah, and and, and I noticed you know I I seen that a bunch of uh, you know ASRs were added to the portal. Was the intent to kind of maybe talk through some of them as examples? Uh, th those were added for you to take uh, to just uh, see where we kind of went through some of these to apply how or so you could see how these new standards would be applied to existing plans. Um, we don't necessarily need to discuss any of any of those just uh, unless you have some specific questions, but those were just there for you to uh, to get a visual measure of how these would be applied. Matt, that was. I, I didn't study all of those ASRs because I, I that was my anticipation as well. I thought we were going to go through some of these and 
and look at how they applied and, and what the impacts were. I thought that's what we had discussed in the last meeting. So I'm, I'm kind of with Matt, I didn't study all those because I, my assumption was we were gonna just use those as talking points to go through some of the um, issues we discussed at the last meeting, but. Yeah, because I mean, I saw, I mean, maybe I missed notes, but I saw a bunch of like red clouds and things, but you know, it's not going, not revealing these. Well, we could we could use some of them if that's what you would like to do, but uh, you know there there are quite a few of them there. So, yeah, Miss Allen, let's let's just go through a few a few of them, a good number, maybe not all of them. Let's just go through a few because that that was my anticipation too that we would go through some of those. Come in, Miller. I saw your hand. I just wanted to um, add a little note on Tier One, Romanet. Four, I think that there's a, a word missing um, after the highlighted section, demolition or replacement of a of a building well, that has a civic use as a principal as a principal use. Yeah. Or a parcel that has a civic use as a, as a principal use. Oh, well, I'm not following. Can you can you repeat that? Um on tier one. Site plan so under description Romanet four. I, just, I think there's just a word missing okay, under sure. Romanet four after the highlighted section, the construction, reconstruction, et cetera, of a civic use. Mm -hmm. I think that that means of a building that has a civic use as its principal use. Mr. Or, Mr. Hall, are you tracking that? Clarification, whatever you. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I got that. Okay. What word were we? But I'm happy to move on to um, to some of these as well. And as we walk through these, one of an, another thing I wanted to um, to just sort of high level clarify is when we're looking at tier one versus tier two, and we're looking at just functionally what the difference is between the requirements between sort of the process and requirements. Um, I see that we've added a couple things on road widening and that kind of thing, but basically the only difference between in the standards, applicable standards between tier one and tier two um, appear to be, it's, it's very limited. Um, and so I was going to see if there's any way we could just functionally clarify the difference, just conceptually, you know, what is what is the major difference between tier one and tier two on some of these um, standards? Well, and, and, and then maybe walking that, through some examples as well. Yeah, to add to that, I think um, I didn't see it. Maybe I missed it. We had some questions at the last meeting about the the milestones that were going to be set my, my understanding was that the intent was that the review periods were truncated as you were in the lower tiers and we had talked about establishing some milestones for review and approval through that that policy and i don't know that i saw that in the text but um, maybe i missed it but you're right when you look at that um, when you look at the matrix Tier one and tier two are identical all the way to the bottom of um, the forestation and tree conservation. And so to your point, how is that there's really not a significant difference between tier one and tier two? It would appear again, maybe as we go through some of these examples, it becomes more evident. But to me, tier one and tier two are, are, are fairly identical and I'm just not certain how practically that's going to um you know improve review periods or the time frame necessary to get the necessary permits in place um right i mean so that was when i was looking at i was saying very few tier two projects are in tier two unrelated to a change in use um but, so the except that now some of this the, that was my sort of comment before but is the intent for tier two to only include a forestation requirement 
when the existing parking lot is expanded from 26 to 50 spaces for reasons unrelated to a change in use or UDO 7.1 parking requirement. Because that just seems like a very specific, when I was trying to read the difference between a tier one and a tier two project when this one forestation requirement would apply and it seems like a very specific and limited type of project. Um, so I wanted to see like an example of what a, that kind of project might be and just sort of understanding conceptually better kind of th things, just a lot of mental gymnastics trying to figure out. Yeah. I'm trying. A couple of things. Um, if you recall, during our last meeting, we had uh, some public comment about neighborhood transitions and there was a request and some discussion about whether those should be applicable to tier one or not. Um, we did not make any changes to that portion of the ordinance, um, but we did, staff has looked at it internally. We don't necessarily have any major issues. Um, with not applying the neighborhood transitions to tier one. Um, and, but we felt that was your policy decision to make, um, but that is one way you could introduce a, a little more distinction between tier one and tier two if you so chose. And the situation that was uh, at hand in that one, I think, was it a change of use? It was. It was yeah, a the change example of use. that was provided was a change of use in an existing shopping center. Right. Where variance was needed to allow basically the building to remain where it, where it had been. And so what if if you all are agreeable to that, what we would do under transition in the table for tier one would be to remove the applicable dot and replace it with footnote C, which is not applicable to a change in use of an existing building. That makes sense. We had that listed as something to discuss with you, but we did not make that change. Um, we just evaluated the request. Mm -hmm. So, so I guess one other point of clarification, and I feel like we maybe talked about this last time, but um, the difference between A and C. I'm, you know, I, I know existing improvements is the existing building on the site. Um, wouldn't that, like, if a if there's existing footprint of a building, wouldn't A be applicable as well? I guess I'm trying to understand the difference there, because a change of use is 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 uh is is not, you know. That is how you're programming the building, but the physical building is actually, I guess I thought transition was tied to the physical structure, not the use, but is transition tied to the use? Transitions are tied to zoning districts. So anytime you have a mixed use zoning district adjacent to a residential district, yeah, um, that's when the transitions kick in. And, and, and under current code, it's not clear that uh, a change of use or existing structures are not subject to those. So then would it make more sense for A and C? A and C? Because if a existing structure is within the required transition zone and it's going through a change, well, and it's maybe it's not going through a change of use, but it's it's adding on, you know, uh, maybe an ADA ramp or something that would have to, they would trigger it to go through permitting, but the back of that structure is within a transitional space, but it's not a change of use, but it falls under within the tier one. Would would that require a to be noted there as well? I think that's a good point. I think we could have A and C. Yeah, I think Matt, when Michael Birch gave that example, I think for the shopping center, it was actually for a loading dock that was, didn't he say it was for a loading dock, which would 
I think it's kind of to your point that it would be an existing improvement. Yeah. Or if it's like a secondary or tertiary use that's that's very minor, but it's not changing the use. So you're saying to 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 the transition on the uh, the grid here to change back to A and C. Is that what we're looking at? It sounds like it. And I guess that's where I guess I was having trouble differentiating the difference between A and C because C is tied to use, where as A is tied to the physicality of an act of sticks and bricks. And so, in all these, in, in you know, where it isn't a dot or a dash, it's A comma D. And so I just I don't know if there's logic to anything being a comma C. Or if everything should be a comma C comma D or, you know, I, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud. I'm trying to find the logic in the physicality of sticks and bricks relative to physical constraints on a site versus. The policy effects. Of a change of use. So I guess just just an example, you know, in a tier one, you have an existing building and you're going to increase it by 3,500 square feet. Yeah. What A says is things like blank wall, um, blank wall, you know, parking setbacks, et cetera. You don't have to go back and retrofit the existing building. But you do have to comply on the new portion that you're adding on. Okay. That that's kind of an example of a difference between A and C. Is okay. where the existing footprint gets to stay as it is, but any new building or new construction has to comply. Okay. So then one so then I guess how would so for like blank wall with C. I, I guess a captures. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that that totally makes sense. Justin. I, yeah, thank you. I mean, I guess I'm just, I'm trying to understand where a. Where a change of use happens. And. It doesn't just fall under a, I guess that that was what I was trying to figure out. I, I guess maybe when it gets to bigger sites is really where it starts to, and that's why the forestation. Mm -hmm. Mr. Holland, can we pull up a couple of these examples um, that we that we talked about earlier? I know I I definitely think that um, the the six thirty Hillsboro. Uh, ASR 42, 2020, that I think is like a, for a smaller, like infill, like something that we'd see with a restaurant, et cetera, especially with all the outdoor seating and everything. I think that that could be a really, um, perhaps a good project to talk through. Yeah, let's look at that. Yeah. If, if you guys will refer to the table. My understanding of this table and, and Justin and Mark jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding of the table, all of the projects listed on the table when reviewed were reviewed as site plans. They did not qualify as a plot plan. And so what the table demonstrates and it shows you what, if it's a change in use, what the change was and if it was an increase in square footage, what the increase in square footage is. And so it goes through to, and if it, there's a footnote, it's triggered, it's at the far right hand uh, column of the table. 
And so my understanding is all of these um, 10, I think there's 10, uh, were all of these 10 or 11 projects were reviewed as site plans when they came in because they didn't qualify as plot plan. But then with the text change, only three of them would fall in the tier three. And the rest would be either a tier one or a tier two. Oh. So it, it may be easier to, to address more of the issues if we look at the table rather than pulling up a specific ASR. Table, what table, David? Yeah, what, what are you talking about? There is in the... Yeah, there's a table that was included um, in the, in board docs. Um, I can try to pull up that table if that helps. Yeah, why don't you pull it up and share it? It's the third to last. It's the one that says site plan examples. Yeah, okay. Plot plan, site plan examples. Okay. Oh, yeah. If you'll pull up that table, it, it lists the description, a summary of the work, what the impact of it was, what the zoning is, whether it under the proposed text change would fall under a tier one, tier two, or tier three, what footnotes, if any, are at work. Um, but if you understand that all of these, when they came through, were reviewed as site plans and not plot plans. Because right now we have two categories. You're either a plot plan or a or full compliant site plan, which would be this tier three. So, um, Commissioner Mann, can I can I suggest that maybe we just ask staff to, and since um, Matt mentioned 630, can we look at one tier one? There's only one tier two and one tier three. Can we maybe just start with yeah. three and sort of go in that order? Yeah, let's start with a tier one, then we'll move to a tier two and a tier three. Different examples. Thanks. Uh, we're tracking. Go ahead, Mr. Um, Collin. Is which which tier one would you like to look at? Uh, let's look at the first one, Urban Access Whitaker Mill Road. Okay. And so let's try. Okay, that was a change from a printing press to indoor recreation. Yes. I don't think there was an expansion there. It was just a change of use. And because the change in use required more parking than was allowed under the plan, uh, it had to be reviewed as a site plan. I think, okay. I think ASR 42-20 is a good example then of what we, I think it's a change. It's got an addition on it. Let's, if we can. Okay. That one okay, give me just a moment. Okay. Can everyone get a good look at that? Can you blow up just a slight bit? Okay. Hmm. 
How's that? That's better. Okay, this is a this was a change of use uh, with an addition. It's a filling station to a restaurant. So. I think this would involve like a demolition of a parking structure in addition to a building. Yes. So this looks like the uh, the existing condition. Okay, let's see. Idea where it's located. Uh, let's see. This is the. Okay, this is a just to orient everyone. This is Char Grill right here. I'm sure everyone knows where that is. Mm -hmm. And this the the service station that's located directly to the right or west of that. Uh, let's see elevations. Okay, this is the utility plan. That's all we have for this one. That's that's the entirety of this plan. So it looks like they are um, expanding the the square footage of the building from 13, 1355 square feet to, or actually, let's see. There's a 43% square footage increase for the same use is the impact. So again, they're, they're changing, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Um, let's see. Yeah, this is the one that went with uh, from 1619 to 3,057 square feet. Mm -hmm. Yes. And under existing code, it was an increase in, in more than 10% of the parking requirement, which meant a full site plan. Under, as written, the proposed draft, since it's a less than 3,600 square foot expansion, then it would fall under tier one. Mm -hmm. So it's a 16... Uh, 1,619 square feet existing and a 1,438 square foot addition to the building. So as, as Justin said, it's, it's less than the 3,600 square feet, which um, puts it into tier one category. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Commission? I can't, let's see. So, so I guess I, what I was kind of curious about slash hoping for is is like a little bit of what what elements what extents of work on this ASR would not be required if it were in tier one like like it is it's effectively that there there's a there's a plot plan survey there's no engineered drawings are there. Like like of the 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 traffic sight lines and all that, and would they still? You know, I know that parking's technically required, so they still have to go through that. Correct. I'm just trying to like visualize from a can standpoint would and wouldn't be required in tier one. Well, one of the biggest things is all of the exactions that are required during site plans such as additional right-of-way dedication roadway improvement sidewalks and so forth um so there's no fee in lieu for any of that in tier one right you don't you don't have to do it so you, it's not a you pay a fee in lieu it's a it it doesn't apply to you and so you don't have to go through that hurdle okay and so if you look i mean on the table if you look at tier th the tier three column at the far right hand side of this is the table in the text change you see all these dots and then in tier one or tier two 
the dashes mean it doesn't apply regardless. If there's a footnote, then it just explains when and if it applies or when it doesn't apply. So the, um, and when you look at the table of examples, the far right hand column will indicate whether or not a footnote was at play to influence whether this fell down as a tier one, tier two, or tier three, or or the footnote will let you know what they did or did not have to do. That's that's the the goal of that okay. last column on the example table. So the example table is two is is two pages long. So if if you pulled it up, there's a second page. Mm -hmm. So David, so like let's start with that then. So tier one, it says amenity. It starts with amenity. And again, so this particular project is not required to provide the amenity as, as directed in that section of the UDO unless they're establishing a civic use of the vacant property involving the total demolition of all building on the site. Is that the way this reads? Yeah, it, unless they're establishing a civic use on a vacant property or in tier one or tier two, we're talking about a total demolition of the site and and reconstruction of something. But if it's a like for like, if they're tearing down what's there and rebuilding it, they're excluded. So That's what put no uh -huh. So along those lines and setbacks is the next one and not required to provide the setbacks per those chapters in the UDO unless and this gets back to some of Matt's questions, A or D, that the, it does not apply to any of the existing improvements at the time of the previous site plan review, not the current, I guess is what I heard Justin say, that if it was existing, you don't have to bring it up to conformity, but any of that 36 or whatever that less than 3,500 square feet of addition they provided would have to meet, well, the setback requirements. Is that correct? That's correct. Whatever new that's being built would have to meet the current code. Okay. So, so something like parking setbacks, it's not applicable to the existing improvements. You know, if, if you're not having to increase now, this is getting a little bit into the weeds, but I'm just trying to understand like where that you know, where that throttle is. And, and so, you know, you still have to have some parking for this restaurant. It was a service station, which had, I assume more, a lot more parking, but it was a, you know, I remember the, the parking lot, it was an old parking lot without much striping. Um, I don't, I assume that this curb cut is still there, but I know that there was a curb cut on the front Theoretically, if there's five parking spaces there as is, would they have, could they just use whatever's there without restriping or anything? Like, will they have to go through restriping? I'm just trying to understand like how some of these start and stop. And that, even though that is kind of in the weeds, but using this as an example, especially since I'm sure that we're gonna see a lot more repurposing of older, structures that have large parking lots for outdoor dining. Um, I'm just curious how this might play in. So as written, um parking setbacks don't apply to existing parking spaces um but other requirements in chapter seven of uh, other parking requirements wouldn't be applicable to tier one okay um you know things like number of spaces dimensions of spaces 
um, based towards. Okay. Because I guess I'm just trying to think through things that are um, what's left up to versus what's, you know, very manageable, you know, um, or or the, the, the expectations are set very clearly. I think, I think the intent there is, you know, if you if you have existing spaces that are otherwise compliant but don't meet the setback, they're allowed to remain and, and okay. Okay. And Justin, I would assume as long as that is as long as those spaces are staying at the same location, but if they're placed otherwise on the site, then they would have to meet the requirements. Yeah, I would say so because it's a it's specific to the setback. So yeah, if you're moving. Yeah. Yeah, if you move them, if you have three spaces on the site and you decide that you want to keep those three spaces, you just want to put them in a different location, then they will be subject to the current standard. Okay. So in this particular case, um, if you zoom into that parking table there, it says that they uh, a variance had been filed for a reduction to five spaces, but the required quantity was 20.38 at one space per 150 square feet. <laughs> so how does a variance, if you're going to BOA, I guess it, it doesn't affect any of the tier one, tier two, you just gotta make sure that they, they sort of worked it into their own schedule, I guess. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you if you don't comply, you know you you still have the same relief mechanisms that exist regardless of tier. Right. Um, You're talking about with the variance because the variance runs with the property. Well, I'm just saying you gotta you gotta go to BOA for that, right? I'm just wondering what the I'm just trying to think out loud about what the impacts of that are. On tier one versus tier two, I guess that's just up to the applicant to sort of work. That, yeah, that would be up to the applicant. Yeah. Okay. All right. But I, but I guess I mean to that point, Brian. It's like, I mean, they. I guess they did make an an addition to this structure. Is that true? Yes. They added less than thirty five hundred square feet. Yeah. It was at 1699. It looks like they expanded it to 3057. I guess it just, you know, it, it also brings up, and I don't think that this is necessarily dealt with here, but I mean, you can't even, I, I'd be hard pressed to fit 20 cars on this lot and park it. And so it also just makes me a little bit like, you know, I, I think the goal of this would be for smaller scale infill to be easier to do. Um, I'm not familiar with the board of adjustment process and how long that takes and how encumbering it is, but I do know it's a quasi judicial process. So I know that you have to hire an attorney, but just a, just a, just a note. I don't know if anyone out there has any thoughts, but. Well, I think um, you bring up a, I think you bring up a good point because again, and I might be wrong on my understanding of the objective of this is to reduce time and cost and to take some of the burden off of some of these smaller infill projects. And you're right, needing to go to board of adjustment and it's not guaranteed. I mean, you have to, and Blanny's our, our attorney. She can tell me if I'm saying something out of turn here, but it's not guaranteed. You have to prove a hardship and they, they could theoretically, they could have come back and said, well, we don't agree with this. With your, with your hardship, you need 20 spaces. So, again, maybe we're getting too much into the weeds. I, I don't know. It's just a lot to absorb and take in. Yeah, what, but but I also think that another good case, like, in point, is aside from a small restaurant, is, is like a four- or six-unit apartment complex where I know that parking has been updated, but if you technically have the same square footage as, say, a large single family, but it's you break it up in you know the same form, a large single family that could have 
six family members versus six smaller, you know, four or 500 square foot apartments. Um, you know, just thinking through, like, I, I, I it, it was my thought that a lot of the policy hopes around this is that it helps smaller scale infill projects. And um, the fact that people have smaller lots because there's less room for cars because they're closer to transit and other things. And um, I guess it's just something to note that, I mean, if, if, if you had a 3,600 square foot, six unit apartment complex, you know, if they're one bedrooms, I guess you'd need seven parking spaces. I was just trying to like think through what other smaller infill projects could be relatively, could be pretty hindered. Um, although not having to go through ASR, so that was all that I was doing, but I don't have enough um, relative context to that. The, the difference between plot plan and site plan currently in the UDO, there's no parking relief other than what parking relief is provided for in chapter seven. Okay, so just because you're a plot plan uh, in today's world, doesn't mean you get parking relief. So that was something that we did not, I guess, include, we did not include any kind of parking relief outside of what's already provided for in the code, which is based on uh, your frontage, your based on location or proximity to transit and so forth. We didn't alter any of those. We were just looking at what sections of the code you would have to comply with. Under plot plan, you have to comply with the parking requirements. And so under tier one, tier two, tier three, we haven't relaxed that. That's we're carrying that forward from what's the requirement today. And if I've said anything wrong, somebody correct me, but my understanding is plot plans still have to comply with 7.1's parking standards. So I guess that that definitely brings up a question where it's like, um, where if square footage is being tied to intensity, you know, it's like 18 square feet of anything <laughs> isn't isn't going to do too much, and and I just quit, you know, and this could be maybe where a bigger difference between tier one and tier two happen based off scale of project, but um. And I, I might be off base here, but but looking through required parking and kind of thinking through some of the logic, it's like if it's less than thirty six hundred square feet of anything, it's I just feel like the whole idea is that it's a very insignificant, it's a very low intensity addition slash transition. And um and just curious if there's some way to the fact that parking has always been the thing that triggers it. We're not, it's not triggering this intensive review process, but it's still there and it's still an issue. And at least I see, I'm looking through the lens for smaller scale infill projects. And I guess I just, th there's a question on whether, you know, parking is a huge catch all. And so I understand the reason to not, you know, it could get challenging to go through and parse things out, but I just wonder if there's something there that could be relatively simple to accommodate that intent of, of, of minimal and of adding a small intensity that was rooted that the square footage was rooted in parking this is eric hodge if i could helpful. comment there's actually something in the udo that allows for that section 712 excuse me 7.1.1.c 
point two says where the number of parking spaces for a new use, new use according to 712C is less than 125% of the parking spaces required for the existing use, no additional parking spaces shall be required. So it, it allows them to expand the, the, the parking requirement, but they don't actually have to provide it if they're if their required parking does not go up by that 25%. Huh. To, to, from use to use or existing to new use? From, from use to use. Mm -hmm. So if the second use comes in and its parking requirement is only 124% of what the previous use was, they get to utilize whatever the existing spaces were. Okay. The same exemption exists for an addition as well. Okay. Correct. That's that's helpful. Thanks for pointing that out. That is helpful, Eric. Thank you. In this case, they were required 2.83 and the new requirement was 20. So clearly that's well above 125%. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how a gas station was at 2.83, but. <laughs> Anyways, Matt, I think you, you know, I think your point is, I, I agree with it. But, you know, I, I thought the objective here was to reduce some of the burden on some of the smaller infill. And maybe there's, it is challenging because the whole thing is, well, initially it was based on parking. It looks like we're shifting that to a, to a more of a square footage. Um, basis, but um, maybe we can just pin that for now and, and keep going because it's, again, it's a lot to wrap our heads around. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. Mr. Holland, let's, uh, while we're wrapping our, our minds around that, let's look at a, an example of a tier two. I think we've had, we have one on our uh, example sheet is SR 3019. Um, it's a fire station on Durant Road. And Mr. McDonald, are you still there? Yes. After we after we look at this example and then we look at the third example of a tier three, we'll uh, have to call it a time back in. Okay. Um, are you referring to people who want? Yeah, I thought we had just one, who was one speaker ready, but we had bad reception. That's correct. Yeah, he has um, called in, so he's available to make comment when when you're ready to receive it. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll receive his comments after we look at two or three. Times. Okay. Okay. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Can you blow it up just a little bit? It's kind of tough for me to see it. It's much better. I just wanted to note for everyone's viewing ability, there should be an option to zoom in and out. Um, potentially, I, th I think a control panel to the left. Um, that's available to everyone, but it should be in case you want to look at any detail in the okay. document. I didn't know that, Keegan. Thank you. I see it now. That's very helpful. <laughs> Thank you for that. Okay, so this is the, um, as you can see, it's the fire station out on uh, Durant Road. This is new construction. 
So civic building of less than 10,000 square feet. So there are several, uh, several footnote, um, footnote exemptions on this one. Um, is this greater than 10,000? Yeah, great, greater than 10,000. Oh, I'm sorry, greater than 10,000 square feet. Mark, can you can you point me to the Romanette that that shows that tier? I'm under number two, tier two site plans. Romanette three. Romanette three. Okay. Romanette yeah. three. Okay. And is there a distinction between tier one? What was the square footage for a, a civic use, a, a civic building with a, a building with a Principal civic use, I guess, to get back to the point, it's kind of seems like that language needs to be cleaned up a little bit. That was 10,000 square feet or less. Yeah, That's tier it. one is 10,000 square feet or less. And then anything more than 10,000 square feet of a civic use, exclusive of schools and places of worship, is a tier two. Thank you. I got it. So I, I guess it, it goes back to Blandy's earlier question. The really the the difference between the tier one and the tier two, if I'm looking at this table, is they're re required to provide tree conservation. And unfortunately, I don't even forestation. I'm not sure exactly what 9.1.9 .9 says. I'll have to look it up. Those are the only differences that appears from the earlier example and this example that they would be required to do. Correct? Maybe. That's right. And depending on the size of this site, they they may not be subject to tree conservation anyway, but I'm not entirely certain how big the site is. But you're right, if it were over two acres, um, then tree conservation and forestation would be. So when we, when we come around to the conversation about the mechanism and the timing and the length of the review, it, it seems like there's really shouldn't be a big difference between tier one and tier two. Urban forestry will, will have to, you know, review, but that's the only addition, right? Yes. And could we just clarify how C would apply here? So forestation requires um, standards apply here, except to the extent, except they're not applicable to a change in use of the existing building. That's right. So it, it is applicable to new buildings. So if this were in tier two purely because of a change in use, that did not drastically impact parking requirements, and that's why it was tier two, then this four station requirement would not apply? That's correct. Okay. Sorry, I was saying, did, did we want to move on to a tier three example or did we want to stay and add some more commentary to the tier two? I'm game for tier three. 
Okay. Two, three. Let's look at ASR 6720. It's a total redevelopment demolition of an existing use of the addition of a new apartment complex. Okay. I didn't hear you. Did you say 6720? Yes, yeah, 6720, King Charles Apartments demolition, new new addition of apartments. Yeah, got it. Thank you. If, if you just look at the table, I think that tells you everything. They went from a boat dealership that was 25,000 square feet to 211,000 square feet of residential in three apartment buildings with 190 dwelling units. And mm -hmm. so that isn't caught in any of the tier one or tier two definitions. So if it doesn't meet any of the tier one or tier two definitions, it's a tier three. Yeah, that seems pretty self-explanatory. Yeah. And then, um, Another example we have of tier three is the demolition of an existing school and construction of the school. ASR 5019. Yeah, that's just uh, demonstrating that even though a school is a civic use, uh, schools and places of worship are carved out of civic uses greater than 10,000 square feet that otherwise would fall under tier two. That's the purpose of showing that one. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about ASR 30, 3520. Uh, that's a tier three as well. Uh, manufacturing warehouse. Uh, I'm not showing it was demolished. I think it was just an addition or renovation. From yeah, yeah, there's an existing portion of that, and they're building a, a 3,000 square foot addition to an existing building. So it's essentially a doubling in size almost. Over, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah over. That's, just, that's just demonstrating where a, you know, a substantial increase in square footage, both percentage and square footage uh, from the uh, existing would still trigger a tier three. Got it. Okay. Do we have any questions with the tier three examples that we just saw? I I did have a, a question from a, a while back. Um, for 6619, ASR 6619, um, and this is just because I'm not this is more for context, but the administrative approval action, is that something that, like, are, are the cross access, access easement and utility placement, are those things that would happen regardless in tier one? Or did those happen because of going through the regular ASR or current ASR? Which exactions, Matt? Um, so in for ASR 6619, the urban access, there's an administrative approval. Yeah. I don't oh, know, maybe I'm reading this wrong, but the I'm just not super familiar with these, and I was just curious if this is was this triggered because of what is what what will be a tier three, or is this something totally unrelated to anything having to do with a, uh, a the tier system? That was that was triggered under under the current code because it was a site plan and not a plot plan. Okay. Which is yeah, which is what a tier three is as proposed. So um, as a tier one, um, you, know, it would just, you know, for things like site access and driveways. You know, only uh, applicable with um, with the caveats of footnotes A and B for most of those things. Yeah. Okay. 
And everything on that table was a site plan and had to go through ASR and was subject to all requirements that they get under the current code. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I, I guess I was just curious if that, I'm just not familiar with what triggers that. I didn't go through it, but um, so, I mean, is there any reason that we, we couldn't um, just have one line item that says if between 36,000 and 9,000, like, uh, for for tier one, you have to adhere to to like um sorry, I just spaced for a second, but like how how to formulate this, but basically to get rid of tier two, since it, it's just a square footage thing, um could could we just somehow envelop that into tier one and and basically depending on the size you just have to meet one extra extra I, i'm just thinking from a from a uh applicant city like resident standpoint like the view of this like saying i'm a tier one tier two tier three it just being kind of like like light versus heavy or you know i guess that's what the plot versus site is now but from an optic standpoint, I, I just don't think it's pretty, pretty odd to have here. So, so you're, you're uh, thinking that there would be uh, two types of tier one plans and a tier two plan, which would be everything that isn't a tier one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. One one uh, tier one would be basically what you see in this tier one, uh, tier one now, like a, a minor tier one would be the tier one as it's written here, but a major tier one would be one that is of a certain um, square footage and also requires the tree conservation and stormwater. Yeah. And then tier two would be what is tier three now? Yeah. Because I, I could also see so like, I could just see there being so much confusion and I'm just thinking also about it from just a usability standpoint. And if the only difference is the size, you know, the square footage triggering the tree conservation, and and really you only have that when you're when you have a much larger site in general, correct? Or larger than two acres. Yeah. Um, so so I mean. It's it's such a it's you know it's like a certain square footage and over two acres is the only difference between tier one and tier two. So it really makes it seems like it makes sense to just say if you're it's it's under nine thousand square feet, but if uh, if you're less than two acres or less than thirty six hundred square feet, you don't have to do that or the, the tree thing isn't applicable. Thank you. I think, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, CJ. No, that wasn't me speaking. This is Justin. I was just going to say, you know, the way, the way I guess we would accomplish that is have fewer tiers, but have more footnotes, I guess, would be the way that that would work. Um, if you wanted to just proceed with the tier one and a tier two with some additional caveats, we've, would either just have to rework or add some footnotes, I guess, would be a, one way to achieve that. So, so Matt, I don't disagree with you because again, I'm still struggling with the difference between tier one and tier two and why there's not a, there's not a lot of difference between the two. So I think your suggestion uh, is good unless we actually wanted to, you know, consider the tier one you know, separating tier one in a different way to make again yeah. that smaller infill um, more accessible to 
to certain size projects. So instead of combining that, I think I think if we keep the text or the objective the way that it is now, combining them makes sense to reduce some of the confusion because there's really only that one small difference and it's kicked in by square footage. Unless we feel like we want to move the tier one in a different direction or, you know, in the other direction and actually see if there are ways to minimize the impacts on some of the smaller projects and, and create a larger difference between the two, pushing tier one, making it uh, simpler, if that makes sense. Again, I'm not being very articulate today, so I'm sorry if that's confusing. I I definitely could get behind that logic to almost, um, yeah, if, um, if tier one somehow were tied to a scale um, of a project, like the, the actual, the actual site size or something like that, um, which, which I guess that's the goal of Did you say, oh, um, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm just like trying to scan this and I'm kind of just babbling out loud, but I'm, I mean, we, we haven't drafted this policy. So, you know, I, I fully respect the, the path that has been taken to get here. Um, but with the logic of a tier two, the tier two variable tying to larger sites, it could be almost, there could be some like rationale behind tier ones being a certain, a certain scale where if it's, if it's over an acre or over a half acre, it can never be a tier one or some, something like that, like to where it's like a little bit more um, visually able to access to where smaller scale retail, commercial and residential kind of could fit in that tier one site plan. And it would be easier to process. Um, my, my immediate, like go to is something to do with parking, but I, I guess with follow on policy, perhaps with missing middle and stuff, there can be some parking policies. Um, so I just, I just know all the small, I mean, all the small little, whether it's commercial or residential infill, parking is the biggest issue. And, and I know that even a do, you know, yes, it's great that a duplex doesn't have to go through um uh regular site plan anymore um but i guess would a maybe to test this w would a four unit would a quad have to go through tier three if it were four thousand square feet Talking about building a four unit apartment complex on a vacant yeah. lot. Yeah. Or is it any, any, um, any, any new, new, any new construction on a vacant lot that's 9,000 square feet or less would be a tier two? With, with a few exceptions. So the civic use. Yeah. Um, if you're introducing a new use on vacant property, okay, if you're introducing a new use on vacant property, that's always, regardless of size, always a tier three, except for the carve outs that we have, which are construction of a new commercial parking lot or reuse of an existing parking lot. This, this, these are the tier one carve outs. Uh, the civic use is a carve out under tier one. The 
public park open space is a carve out. Um, the tree removal is a carve out. The let's see, I'm losing track of myself here. The detached or attached house uh, accessory dwelling unit. Those are all carve outs. And so but anything else, for example, regardless of size, if you have a vacant track and you're putting a bank on it or a, a retail shop on it, that would be, regardless of size, a tier three. Hmm. Okay. Now, if we had talked about loosening the standards for tier one with transitions based on public comment at our last meeting. There's been question about amenity in tier one that could be shifted. Um, I'm not sure exactly how we would address parking relief, but we can look into parking relief for a tier one. Um, is there anything else that you would want staff to look at to distinguish more so tier one from tier two? I mean, I don't know, Brian, you know this stuff really well. I mean, I feel like those make a lot of sense. I mean, I, I don't know how parking would, would be addressed, but, um, and I also don't know the, you know, the outcome if, if, if like how that could be manipulated or what the, you know, externalities of that are. Um, I just know that that is such a hindrance now to, to what I think, you know, we're, we're needing to see more of. And so, um, it's just, it's just really a thought. I, I don't know enough about chapter seven and how this could relate to it to, I don't disagree with you, Matt. I think, um, David said that they, they could take a look at it, I guess. Yeah, maybe just to help me uh, or Mark on just to to respond to David's question about more of a distinction of protective yards in a tier one. It doesn't seem like there's a caveat for existing conditions if they don't meet on a small infill project. Is that one that we might want to think about? Yeah, right now we have them applicable just like we have transitions applicable in tier one. So, um, you know, that is something we could look at applying those same footnotes that we discussed earlier where changes of use or and or existing buildings do not have to comply with those. Yeah, because I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I could see whether it'd be non-conforming on an existing. Certainly, if you like, you were saying earlier, if you tear it down and rebuild it, you should conform to the new requirements. CJ, yes, Key. Just wanted to make you aware that one of the attendees, Jason Meadows, who asked to speak, uh, he let me know that he only has a, about 10 or 15 minutes left. Um, just wanted to make you aware in case he's able to speak before he has to go. Yeah, let's, let's let him on now while we're, while we're having this downtown. Um, Mr. Meadows, let's let him on. Okay, one, one moment. <laughs> All right, Jason, you should be unmuted if you're able to speak. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank, thank you all so much for um, 
putting this together. I know this is um it's been a a long road to get here. Um, I recently ran across uh, an issue um, on a plot plan that I thought would be applicable to this conversation as it would relate to uh, existing driveway spacing and existing driveway location um, as res in respect to the Raleigh Street Design Manual. Um, for example, an existing site uh, that's going through a plot plan with two driveways that do not meet the um, avenue classification, the two-lane avenue street classification for our current driveway separation. Mm -hmm. um, so I see, I see the the current text change language of, uh, addresses UDO Chapter Eight uh, for site access, but I I don't know, and I, I'm, I guess I'm asking the question if that would. Uh, properly address the application of driveway spacing with relationship to existing driveways. Thank you, Jason, for your question. Um, the staff, I, well, I was going to say, in addition to the uh, the chapter eight reference. For site access, the next one is driveway, where it's also treated the same way, and that includes chapter one. I believe chapter one is where we acknowledge cross referencing other manuals. So I'll defer to Justin as to what he thinks on this, but I would think it addresses that concern. Yeah, I would agree. Um, site access, the driveway spacing is in 835, which is the site access. Um, so as, as drafted, if you're talking about what would be a tier one, footnote A would apply which is not applicable to existing. Okay. Okay. I just, there, there were no references to the RSDM, but I do see by, you know, inference of those of chapter eight and then further, you know, back to chapter one, um, as Mr. York mentioned, I do see where that um, might make sense. Um, is there, I'm going I'm to ask this as a little off subject, but is it is it understood currently that a plot plan should bring in such uh, questions about possible closing of an existing driveway in that in that sense, or is there some language that I'm missing that we should talk about? Probably you're asking, don't. You're asking um, what the current code requires? Yes, I believe so. We should, we, let's take a look at that and we'll have a conversation with you directly. Okay, I would appreciate that. This is the first time on, on a plot plan that I've talked about drive, driveway spacing with transportation subs. So I wanted to be, I just wanted to bring that up today and, and for the text change and make sure that uh, when we were talking about a lot of these other issues as well, um, we had addressed it properly. And um, second, and, second and last point, I know you guys are busy, so uh, very quickly, um, are there any, under tier one, are there any dedications for easements, um, whether utility or cross access or anything like that that would require a recorded plat um, other than possibly like a drainage easement that may be required for stormwater? Um, along those lines. So under footnote F as a tier one, if a new use 
voluntarily con connecting to city water or sewer for the first time. Um, some type of utility easement. Uh, I suppose that could require um, a plat. Okay. So that's the only, it looks like the only instance where, you know, a new easement, like you said, other than a okay. water access or maintenance easement may be required. Okay. All right. Hey, hey Jason. Okay. Yes, sir. One um, under the driveway specifically, I've got the UDO open under um, chapter eight. Where were you getting hung up? Just on the spacing? Uh, yeah, so, <clears throat> so transportation is, is talking specifically about section 8.3.5A1. That right, states on, all on. existing. Oh, go ahead. 8.3.5A1. Okay, go ahead. So it states all existing and proposed development must provide satisfactory means of vehicle and pedestrian ingress and egress from a street or a budding site. Um, that is the code reference that I was given that transportation is reviewing existing driveway spacing on a spot plan. Okay. Yeah, Jason, like David said, if we could just follow up with you on that one, um, we might have some. That would be great. Some conversation about that. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Uh, Keegan, do we have any more um, registered guests to speak? Yeah, so we do have two call-in users. Um, I'll just call them specifically based upon the digit of their, um, or I guess their call-in user title. Um, I'm not sure if one of those persons is who signed up to speak in advance because their names are not listed, but I will try calling them and seeing if either is one to speak. Uh, the first is calling user three. Um, calling user three, I'm going to unmute you in case you are wanting to uh, make comment. Is that me? Yeah, are you, are you there? Before you uh, speak, can you please state your name? For public record? Yes. This is Pam Davis, and I'm at 1346 Baez Street. Okay. And I was calling about the text change about the um, setbacks and height methodology. Uh, I um, am a, just an average citizen as far as understanding these things. And I would say it would be a lot easier for people like me to understand it if there was an illustration. Because we commented on the text, the text change portal, which is very helpful, but I think it would be clearer for most people if we could have pictures like they have in the UDO. There are lots of illustrations in the UDO to demonstrate. And just with something like this, just so people can know what's happening and there's more transparency. That is just my only feedback on that. That's all I had to say, and I thank y'all so much for all the work you do. I've been listening to this whole thing and y'all work really hard and I'm appreciative. Thank you, Pam. Thank you. Um, I think it, it gives reference to this chart we've been going off of for sections uh, chapter 10 to the UDO. And um, I'm pretty sure it, it might have, I think it has pictures um, for um, setbacks and public requirements in chapters two and three. Mr. Holland or anyone for staff, if, if, am I correct in saying that? Yes, we do have illustrations in the uh, in the showing how those uh, how those are actually measured and how and the placement of those. So there are illustrations in the in the UDO currently that have how those are measured. But uh, I think maybe she's looking for something as with height, maybe something specific to these, but. Um, it may be that it's something that's already in the UDO, just uh, we can point in the right direction, which I, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I'm wondering, CJ, if she was, because she mentioned the text portals, 
portal specifically. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering if she was um, in, uh, suggesting that as part of the text changes, we're going through some of the stuff that we also provide graphics to show what the difference is to help her understand what the implications of the text change are. That's what I kind of thought I heard her say. Right. CJ, we do have one other call-in um, who I can't see the name of, and I'm happy to ask them as well if they would like to come. Okay, let's let's get them online and um, is it it's called? Please state your name uh, and address. Or okay, one moment. I will unmute them. So call in user four. Uh, I will unmute you now if you had any comment you would like to make. Um, get your name for the record when I do. It appears that no comment that they would like to make at this point. Okay. Uh, I did just want to make a general announcement to any other attendees. I've made this comment in the chat, but if you would like to comment, I know we're running short on time, but you can send me a private message and I can relay that to the chair of the committee um, so we can unmute you and have you make comment. And I'd like to uh, make a comment to the last com the last call of comments um, about having graphics in the text change. How feasible and realistic is that? um having diagrams with regards to height and setbacks and others added to uh this text change that we're talking about you mean to have those as part of this uh, documentation and available for the public hearing yeah yeah well we would have to go through our uh or uh, another department with graphics put together. It's not something that we can quickly turn around. Right, right. And when's our deadline of fraction on this case? I don't have a problem. September the 28th. Okay, so yeah, I think maybe the best thing to do is probably guide uh, citizens as to how they can use the UDO as to finding uh, chart from diagrams with height and setbacks as to as the to add it on to this text change. This Just a what? point of clarification: we're nothing in this text change is suggesting that we change the methodology for measuring setbacks or measuring building height. What's in the code is not, this text change is not trying to change that. This is just saying what development applications have, to, what sections of the code development applications have to comply with based on the intensity of the, the development. And so we're not suggesting that how uh, height is measured is altered in any way. We're not suggesting how building setbacks are measured is changed in any way. Uh, we're saying that if you have an existing structure, you're not changing your structure, you're just changing the use of your structure. We don't measure your height because you already have the structure. We don't measure your setback because the structure's already there. And so that's all we're saying in this text change. And so I'm not sure if, if Ms. Davis was referring to this text change or another text change that has been posted up on the portal. I'm not sure, but there's no intent and there's no change in the code proposed with this text change that would impact the methodology of measuring height or measuring setbacks. And I think, again, I'm just, I might be reading between the lines here, but what I heard her say was because she talked about the portal and I, there was a previous text change about or I guess they're still current about how we're measuring height. And I think she was just yeah. suggesting that in some instances, when the public is reviewing and utilizing that portal 
and looking at the text change, I, what I heard her say was that perhaps including some graphics similar to, to what are in the UDO would be helpful for the public to read through this stuff because it's intense even for us, much less folks who are just trying to pick this up and understand it for the first time. That's what I thought she suggested. I will note that Pam has messaged me privately to say um, she concurs, I think, with Mayor O'Haver's comments. The chat function is only to me as the moderator, but I just wanted to let you know it sounds like uh, she was affirming those comments. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that we're not trying to change any of that. I misunderstood what she was asking for. I thought there was some confusion that we were trying to change methodologies of, of those measurements in this text change. I just wanted to clarify that we were not. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, Commissioner Mann, if your your last question about our deadline was September, or oh, where did I write it down? September 28th. Mm -hmm. so, um, I don't think we're going to get this out of this committee today. Is there some type of extension or something that we need to Today's the 10th. We, we do have another meeting next week um, on the 15th. Um, I, Justin, maybe you can weigh in on this. I know we have one item on that agenda already. I don't know how, you know, if there's something that we can provide between now and then. That's kind of a tight turnaround for us since things really need to be in board docs by tomorrow. Uh, otherwise, we would probably, um, it just can't be discussed. At the next regularly scheduled planning commission meeting, we would have to go to the council to get an extension. Commissioner O'Haver, how many changes were you tracking um, with with regards? Because I, I know it was there's a whole lot to digest, but I didn't see a whole lot of changes to track um, as far as our comments. Yeah. Um... Good question. I guess I I still have some questions around whether or not they're going to be, and maybe it's not part of this particular text in the code, but I'm still curious on the impacts of a tier one, tier two, or tier three on the review time frame and what what the differences are on those. And I think we talked last week about um perhaps suggesting some of those. I, I'm also curious, um, Justin, did, um, has any of this, I think, I know it's on the portal, but have we had any conversation with DSAC recently on any of these? I'm just curious on some of these more recent revisions. If, if you're asking recent revisions as in since the last time this committee met, no. Um, but I mean, DSAC reviewed has reviewed this pretty in, in detail, right? Initially, haven't they? That's right. They were. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. I, I would just add, you know, again, I know we talked about it last time. Certainly there's opportunities for to discuss process and streamlining those sorts of things, but I, those aren't part of what gets put in the code and it's not part of the text amendment. Um, certainly, there'll be a process for that and for, you know, our, our staff to, to look at how they're going to change applications and review timelines and that kind of structuring, but um, not anything that necessarily we need to worry about putting as code language in, in this change. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I guess then, CJ, I guess just the biggest thing that sounds like we, we talked about today was do we feel like three tiers are necessary? Mm -hmm. um, is there a way to combine them? I, I agree with Matt. If it's if it's really just that one differentiator of the tree conservation for a certain size addition on a lot that's two acres or greater, because that's when tree conservation kicks in, it seems like there might be an opportunity to simplify it. Um, but I don't know if we we feel like that's necessary. I know that this has been a hot topic and a lot of people want to get this out and going. Um, so I guess I would just look to you and, and to Matt and 
you know, we can follow up with Blanny about whether or not we we feel like that's critical enough to ask for an extension. I was tracking one change or, or a couple of changes on my end. Um, section under section five, tier one, um, numerate two. Um, there was a slight amendment towards the highlighted wording that we had mentioned. Um, I, I, I can't, I, I don't have the exact wording that we mentioned, but I, I had a note that we were talking about changing some wording of the highlighted section on numerate two. Yeah, that was, um, uh, Blaney brought that up and that was, um, the construction, reconstruction, addition, repair, alter, demolition, and or replacement of a building housing a civic use. Okay. Building housing a civic use said should be added there. Gotcha. And then also and that, that was it. That would be in section, uh, section five under tier one and tier two, because it's basically the same language on those two. Right. I mean, we talked about some additions and some additional word into the footnote section. Yes, and that would be in the transition to add uh, where is currently a dot for the transition. It would now read A and C across all three tiers. Right. Okay. So those are the, the changes I was tracking as far as schematics go, but as far as procedurally, I, I understand what we're talking about is combining um, tier one and making it tier one and tier two, making it one big tier with different layers to it, and then changing tier three and making that tier two. Um, that's just something we need to talk about and decide on what we want to do move forward. Matt, do you have any? I know that's what what, what you were thinking about or doing. <clears throat> it ties into, I guess that. The bigger question that I just am not sure if we're going to actually answer that here or not. Um, with, with regard to what filter of projects and, you know, types of housing and types of commercial building that we, you know, we, we know we need more of how that could help us in that. Um, you know, it, I could see it maybe coming, you know, being part of some of the missing middle policy or something like that as well. So I, I, I don't, you know, I get the only question, you know, I, I do know that some of these, so like um, transition, protective yard, maybe we were going to update the chart. I guess I, I don't know if, if there is a simple way to possibly handle a little bit of the parking intensity slash demands with the same logic used for the square footage. That I guess that's really the only question. And that could be a differentiator for tier one. Um, no, I I guess I don't know the administrative side of like, you know, whether we put this out without recommendation to review some of the language at the main planning commission, but I'm I'm really hesitant to move this, or I'm really hesitant to support moving this out without recommendation with length we haven't seen. Just from my experience in the last six planning commission meetings, with the workload that we have, it's you know it could really get us in the weeds. So, um. Hey, Matt, what if, I mean, let's, I, I, we can ask Mark and Justin and David, but it, I, I, I still agree with you and, and, and David seemed to indicate that there might be a, a way to address the parking demands on tier one. Uh, we talked about this combination of tier one and tier two, and they can look at that, that language. And then the transition, the transition piece, I think we've agreed on. And then Justin was just going to look at the protective yard to make sure that um, there wasn't some kind of hang up there, but is it reasonable to see if we could have just those revisions by the next uh, tech change meeting, which is on the 15th? Again, I don't know what their workload is, but if it's those three things, um, and then, you know, CJ had mentioned a couple of the, the um, 
you know, just cleaning up some of the language, those should be pretty straightforward to, to make sure those get completed. Would, would you feel better then if we were able to look at that at the next meeting and get on board if staff could do that? I think I would, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak and then David and Mark can jump in if that's going to be correct. I, I think we can look into those three or four changes and have you something for Tuesday. Um, I think if the if the ask was to go back and look at fewer tiers or reworking the whole kind of system, that might be that would be a little more challenging. Um, but I think the three or four things Ryan just mentioned um, should be able to incorporate and and have back for you on Tuesday. David or Mark feels differently. I agree with that. Yeah, I'm on board. Okay. Okay. Great. So we'll we'll get those three or four changes uh, a minute and have it for uh, our next Tuesday committee meeting, and then we'll review it and hopefully we can move it out to the main uh, planning commission. Okay. And can, uh, what, one final question, and this is more so. Um, I, I know that legally, I think sometimes our hands are tied in North Carolina relative to other states, but in some other states that I've worked in, um, different policies around um, have uh, periods of review, uh, sorry, periods of practice with uh, automatic review. And I think something that I've noticed, and this is a little bit higher level, more macro, but like, is it we work through this stuff and, and I've, you know, I've asked before about pilot projects or things like that to really test things out in the field or to go through the whole application process, which I know is cumbersome. But I didn't know, is there any way to like actually tie in some sort of trigger where we have, it's like whether it's six or nine months or a certain threshold of projects utilize a new code that is law, but that it might, if there's certain things we have to clean up or that aren't working, that it would be an easier way to facilitate a feedback loop, make things more effective and in line as opposed to trying to create entirely new text changes, that it could almost be a, I don't know, an amendment to a text change. I mean, I realize it, it probably formally on paper be a, a new. I don't know, creating some sort of system to where as we go through the process and we learn. It, it's it, it's a smoother ramp back to. Figuring out a few corrections to make it more effective. Um, you know, because it seems like every almost every text change that I've seen for the last five years. At, to no one's fault, like, and to shifting, you know, everything going on with between growth and everything else, like, you know, there seem to be things that unintended consequences, and that are, I think are just happening everywhere. Uh, if you're not practicing in the field, and I'm just kind of curious, and this is maybe just lobbing it on on y'all side, you know. Um, uh, of the city is just is like is there something that we could implement tie into the to the actual policy tie into the language um, that that could somehow create a, a secondary soft on ramp to helping or fixing things if need be. Um, I, I know it's a lot more complex than it sounds, but it, it it's it's just a thought. Um, I do know that there has have been these like pilot or test periods. Um, that I've worked in in other cities, uh, pilot areas like pilot policies, and and where there there's still some wiggle room after a certain amount of time, and um, and just have seen it to be really effective, uh, especially if there's small little minutia that that could be really getting in the way or causing issues for people, um, whether whether it's applicants or the city. <clears throat> So Matt, I, I would just say, even, even as a practitioner, I mean, we can't, we can't 
predict all of the unintended consequences. So if something like that were available, again, I don't know what that would look like. It seems like that would make sense and reduce some of the heavy lift to, to you know, getting into some of that minutia to be able to have a different uh, avenue to to revise that. So I don't know what that looks like, but I hear what you're saying. Mr. Hugh, did you have anything? I thought I thought I saw you pushing it to talk. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, unfortunately, right now, any change to the text of the UDO requires us to go through the procedure we're going through. Um, now, we could put language in the UDO that allowed for minor changes, but that, too, has to be developed in very objective standards. Otherwise, it triggers a quasi-judicial decision. And so it's we uh, we we do have our hands tied somewhat on some of these things, but um, we can we can look into that. I don't know that we can address it in this text change, but we can look into that. Okay, thanks. thanks. Um, Mr. McDonald, do we have any anybody else um, signed to speak? Because I'm as getting close to our ending time. I just want to make sure that we heard everything before we signed off. Yeah, I have not heard from anyone else who wishes to speak this time. Okay, thanks. Um, committee members, do we have anything else to add uh, before our next Tuesday meeting? Um, and I suspect we'll be getting the changes to review. Those three or four changes um, that Justin mentioned and Mr. Holland mentioned, we'll get those by next Tuesday and we'll be able to review and um, move this thing to full plan of commission. Great job, CJ. Yeah, thanks, CJ. Okay, <laughs> thank you all. Um, we'll see you next Tuesday. Um, everybody stay safe, stay blessed. We'll see you next Tuesday. All right, see y'all.